At the turn of the 20th century, the Islamic world continued on their decline. Yet, in order to stop their demise, a whole range of ideas were being presented, like constitutionalism, pan-Turkism and the likes. But while the Ottomans were busy accepting German aid and assistance, the Persians were stuck far away, gradually falling under the influence of the Russians. For instance, their best troops were the Russian-trained Cossack Brigade. The people also suffered under Qajar rule, paying high taxes to pay off Mozavar ad-Din's debts. So, in 1905, when a couple of merchants were whipped in the streets, the people protested. This group of protesters consisted of religious scholars, businessmen, liberals, nationalists and a lot more. The army chased them into a mosque, setting off much larger protests around the city. The Shah agreed to make some compromises, however he quickly broke these promises, and more protests erupted. The Cossacks then killed some, forcing many to seek sanctuary at the British Embassy. In fact, there were 12,000 people in the Embassy Gardens, and the Shah finally relented. In late 1906, just a few days before he died, he agreed that a majlis or parliament should be created, and they should create a constitution. But, like in the Iranian Revolution decades later, the liberals and Islamic revolutionaries that opposed the Shah could agree on very little. There was also a new feminist organisation, known as the Women's Freedom Association, and one of the most prominent members was Taj al-Sultana. She was the daughter of the Shah, and today she's most famous for her pretty unique appearance. But she was an early advocate of women's rights, and led marches in the capital. She also believed in abolishing the slave trade, despite being raised by slaves in the palace. However, the initial constitution refused women the right to vote. Many also deemed this new constitution as being too liberal, so amendments were made. Like all laws must be approved by clerics, and the Shah still had the authority to declare war. But the new Shah, Muhammad Ali, was still opposed to the whole thing. Meanwhile, the British and Russians were ending the great game, as Britain was now far more concerned about the growing power of Germany. And as they formed an alliance with France, this largely put them into the same camp as Russia. Plus, after Russia's defeat to Japan, the Tsar wanted to gain some sort of victory to improve his prestige. So the two sides met to discuss the Turkish Straits and Persia. They saw the new government as weak and less open to selling concessions. So the Russians proposed dividing Persia into spheres of influence. This also meant that they would help restore the Shah to power. And fortunately for the Shah, Parliament by this point was already falling apart. The Prime Minister, Nasrullah Pernia, didn't have a majority support, and Parliament couldn't agree on most things. So between March to December 1907, there were four Prime Ministers, and protests broke out against the cuts in the salaries of government workers. On the other side of the political spectrum, there were more radical constitutionalists, and they tried to assassinate the Shah in early 1908 by throwing grenades at his car. To end this political stalemate, Vladimir Lyakov and his Cossack brigade moved into the capital, bombarded parliament, and made himself the military governor of Tehran. He then quickly executed a number of constitutionalists, during this, the minor tyranny. But around the country people rose up, like in Tabriz, Gilan and Isfahan. Not all of these were supporters of parliament, as some were just angered by the Shah's oppression, or wanted autonomy. Like Mirza Kutchuk Khan would later create the jungle movement of Gilan, looking potentially for independence. While in Tabriz, the likes of Satar Khan led the rebels in defending the city for months. And Ali Koli Khan Bakhtiari led his tribe around Isfahan and formed alliances with tribes like the Kashkai. But first I'd like to thank Aura for sponsoring this video. Are you tired of constantly receiving spam phone calls to the point where you don't even answer your phone anymore? Well, Aura is here to help. Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. Well, Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. These brokers are actually legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, they just make it incredibly hard to do so. So, Aura will do it for you. It's really easy to set up and you can get it for an incredibly reasonable price. So, let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online, while you get on with your life. Don't let people continue exploiting and profiting from your private information. Go to Aura.com slash Jabsy. There, if you are from the USA, you can start your two-week free trial today. And you can take a look if your personal information has been compromised. Again, that's Aura.com slash Jabsy. But now, let's get back to the video. Rebellions continued to spread, and they began to advance on the capital in 1909. 
the Russians, trying to put pressure on them, decided to invade Persia and march on Tabriz yet again. But the rebels continued and took over the capital, in what has been called the Triumph of Tehran. Parliament was brought back, the Shah had to step down in favour of his son Ahmed, while many of the royalists were executed. This actually included many prominent Islamic scholars, like Sheikh Fazlullah Nouri. But the Russians still entered Tabriz and tried to put forward their demands. However, negotiations constantly broke down, so they remained there crushing rebellions throughout the First World War. The British didn't oppose this action, as ever since their agreement with the Russians, the Great Game had largely ended. And Afghanistan was guaranteed as part of the British sphere of influence, while also acting as a buffer between the two empires. There, Habibullah Khan ruled from 1901 until the First World War, and largely the country finally remained relatively peaceful. There was a small rebellion in Kost when a member of the Gajili tribe claimed the throne, but the government had been modernising their army and quickly put it down. And the end of the Great Game brought about huge changes in the Ottoman Empire as well, as when the British and Russian royals met with one another, it sparked a constitutional rebellion. This was started by the Young Turks, who much like the Young Ottomans beforehand, wanted to bring about huge changes to the empire. The most important group within this movement was the CUP, which was founded by members of the Imperial Military School of Medicine, but as per usual there were divisions. So while Ahmed Reza led the CUP, others joined the Liberal Party, like Mehmed Sabahaddin. He hoped that the Ottoman Empire could begin to follow the example of British liberalism instead. They recruited a number of influential officers like Enver Pasha and Mustafa Kemal, later known as Ataturk, and they largely took over the Third Army. This army was stationed in the Balkans and was central in the Macedonian conflict. Macedonia then was still in Ottoman hands, but it was divided between Greeks, Serbians, Turks, Bulgarians and more, and all of the respective nations wanted to take over it. Ahmed Niazi began to recruit more people into the Young Turks, determined to hold on to the land. And then when he heard that Tsar Nicholas and Edward VII met with one another, he became convinced that they were going to partition Ottoman lands again. So Niazi, along with Enver Pasha, took a band of soldiers into the mountains and rebelled. It was all poorly planned though, but as Niazi said, it was either death or the salvation of the fatherland. Many soldiers deserted to join their ranks, along with many local Albanians, and even Bulgarians in Macedonia, who were promised equal treatment. They then marched on the capital, and Abdul Hamid quickly gave in to their demands and brought back the constitution in July 1908. The CUP though only gained 60 out of nearly 300 seats. So instead, Kamil Pasha was brought into power, and the CUP looked to influence politics from the background. Also, in the elections, the rest of Turkey voted for groups like the Liberal Party, or many ethnic representatives. Like Arabs would get 60 seats, Albanians and Greeks over 20 each, Armenians 14, Slavs 10, and Jews 4. However, 1908 was a pretty disastrous year for the Ottomans. Austria annexed Bosnia, Bulgaria declared their independence, and Crete formed a union with Greece. The new government therefore was instantly seen as incredibly weak. To make matters worse in the capital, parliament was divided and even the Young Turk split. Some like Camille favoured a more liberal decentralised state to gain the support of groups like the Albanians, while the CUP favoured centralisation and the promotion of a Turkish identity. The CUP and their third army then arrived in the capital late in the year and arranged for many Albanian troops, who they believed were hostile, to be transferred to Yemen or be disbanded. The Albanians tried to mutiny, but they were put down violently. Kamil then tried to limit the CU's power by appointing his own ministers, but the CUP managed to persuade Parliament into forcing him to resign. Many now became convinced that the CUP would move against the Sultan himself. Among them was a Sufi mystic named Hafiz Deviz Vardetti. He created an Islamic group in newspaper denouncing the new group as capitulating to the Europeans and going against Islamic traditions. Then when a journalist critical of the CUP was killed, the people protested in the city. They were joined by many soldiers and religious students as they surrounded parliament, demanding the return of Sharia law. Many in the CUP fled and reorganised under Talat Pasha, but this had divided the entire empire. For instance, the CUP had support among some leaders in the Balkans, like Prenk Bib Doda. He was an Albanian leader that was more fearful of the Sultan than the CUP, 
while others like Isa Bolotini in Kosovo supported the Sultan as he disliked many of the CUP's modern centralizing reforms. Plus inside the capital, the Liberal Party tried to maintain peace in the parliament and appease their new Islamist allies. The CUP then created the Action Army in Macedonia and once again marched on Istanbul, this time demanding that the Sultan resign. They arrived and fought their way through the streets and the assembly then voted to depose the Sultan in favour of Mehmed V, who had to accept the new constitution. However, the young Turks faced a number of disasters and their revolution caused a great deal of alarm and a lot of hope throughout the empire. Many Armenians, for instance, celebrated the demise of the Red Sultan, but the young Turks would be responsible for many more Armenian massacres. And almost instantly, a massacre took place in Adana. The reasons behind this though have been disputed. It could have been because of increased Armenian migration to the city, a growing sense of nationalism, or as one British officer said, what can be thought of a preacher, a Russian Armenian who preached revenge for the martyrs of 1895. Revenge, he said, murder for murder, by arms, an Ottoman Muslim for every Armenian of 1895. In the end though, thousands of Armenians were killed in the city by both civilians and soldiers. Like one newspaper reported, Adana is terrorised by 4,000 soldiers who are looting, shooting and burning. There is reason to believe that the authorities still intend to permit the extermination of all Christians. However, the new Grand Vizier, Hussein Hilmi Pasha, argued that, Before the Armenian political committees began to organise in Asia Minor, there was peace. I will leave you to judge the cause of the bloodshed. In the aftermath of the massacre, the young Turks did punish people, but they punished both Turks and Armenians, as they still blamed the Armenians for the events. And from here on out, every massacre will be hotly debated by people on both sides. The Armenian revolutionaries though weren't just present in the Ottoman Empire, as across the border in Persia, they held a congress, and under Yeprin Khan, they agreed to support the constitutionalists and fought alongside Sato Khan. Also, back in the Ottoman Empire, many Arabs were now determined to break free from the Young Turks and their pro-Turkish policies. Like in 1909 over in Paris, three students founded al Fatat and hosted a small Arab congress of 1913. This would also include Rashid Rida's more conservative Arab League Society, the Covenant Society which was mainly composed of Iraqi officers, and the Ottoman Party for Administrative Decentralization, founded in 1913 in Syria. The goals of these groups ranged from independence for Iraq and Syria to restoring the Caliphate, and from liberalism to Islamism. Plus the intellectuals at the Congress were mainly based in the Levant and Iraq, meaning leaders in the Arabian Peninsula were left out. At this congress though, they did create a flag bearing the Arab colours, and then they returned to the empire. Yet the real independence movements truly began in the Arabian Peninsula. Like in Kuwait, Mubarak had already asserted his independence and began supplying weapons to the enemies of the Ottomans. The Young Turks actually conceded control over most of his territory as well, with the signing of the Anglo-Ottoman Convention of 1913. They created what was called the Blue Line and then a year later the Violet Line, which recognised British influence over most of Eastern Arabia. This was still at a time when the Turks were losing lands, so they desired to have some sort of ally on the world stage. Britain though would agree not to annex territories like Bahrain, while the Ottomans largely withdrew all of their claims. And this land would also include the empty quarter of Arabia, or Rub al Khali. However, as the name suggests, it was mainly empty, and the first foreigners to cross the deserts here were Bertram Thomas and St John Philby in the 1930s. But just across the border from Kuwait in Basra and southern Iraq, the Ottomans had to face a number of challenges, starting with the Muntafiq. This collection of Shia tribes united under Saad Dun al-Mansur and rebelled. They had, back in 1899, received support from Mubarak and the Saudis and attacked the Shamar Emirate. Jabal Shamar won though, and Saad Dun was forced into an alliance with them. But beginning in 1903, he led the Muntafiq into attacking other tribes in southern Iraq and defeating Ottoman troops. All of this greatly worried the Sultan, so Abdul Hamid in fact promised to pay them to stop. But Saad Dun wanted to reclaim all of his tribe's ancestral lands. So he rose up again, and in 1908, even looked to get British protection. By this point though, the Young Turks had taken over, 
and they launched further campaigns into Iraq. Saad Dun would later be betrayed and handed over to the Ottomans. And his betrayer was another challenger to Ottoman control in Iraq, Sayyid Talib. He was a descendant of Muhammad and early on his family had been vying for power. He was then appointed as the governor of Al-Hassa and tried to crush the Bedouins. Yet he forced many of the tribes to pay him money for their safety and he used this money to bribe the nobles of Basra. But for his actions he was fired from his position. So he returned to the capital and there after witnessing the Young Turk revolution he began to correspond with Mubarak in Kuwait and Khazal al-Kabi the ruler of Arabistan in Persia. He also founded his own groups and newspapers, advocating for Arab independence, with himself as ruler, uniting both Sunnis and Shias. The Ottomans tried to have him assassinated, but he continued his activities even after World War I. There were other secret societies formed within Iraq, like the Al Yad al Sada, which was a terrorist group that planned on assassinating any Arab leader who opposed Arab nationalism. The British meanwhile had been giving money to the holy Shia cities of Najaf and Karbala, money which was bestowed to them by an Indian prince. But British interest in the region, at least for now, was limited. Like even in 1913, Charles Hardin said, Every effort should be made to avoid action likely to lead to partition of the Ottoman Empire, either now or in the future. And he, like many, believed attacking the Ottomans would inspire rebellions among the Muslims in India and they largely believed that claiming parts of Mesopotamia wouldn't even be worth it. Even encouraging rebellions would not be beneficial. As one consul said, By interference of the most limited character, we start on the road of which we cannot see or imagine the end. But they did have potential allies in the region who were looking for British protection. Otherwise in Mecca, the Sharif, Abd al Illa Pasha died. A few men submitted their names to the Sultan to be made Sharif next. They decided to appoint his nephew to rule next though, Ali Pasha ibn Abd Allah ibn Muhammad. But he wouldn't rule for long. He was vehemently opposed to the Young Turk Revolution and flogged men who discussed the new constitution. The governor of Hejaz also opposed the revolution, so the CUP arrested him and forced him to swear on the Quran to uphold constitutional laws. The Sharif didn't want to suffer a similar fate, so he accepted his dismissal and fled to Cairo. Hussein bin Ali took over next and he would be the leader of the Arab revolt in World War I. However, I should also say that there was a grand mufti within Mecca at the same time. One of the previous muftis was Ahmad Zaini Dalan. He was a critic of Wahhabism and a supporter of Sufi practices. He also approved the use of radio devices for religious purposes and music in religious festivals. So in general he believed that Wahhabism would divide the Islamic world and ultimately destroy it. But elsewhere, in the late 19th century, he supported Islamic rebellions in Sudan and Indonesia, while tutoring some of the most influential people, like Ahmed Raza Khan Barelvi, who would go on to found the Barelvi movement in South Asia, which counters the more radical Diobandi movement. And in Arabia, he taught Hussein bin Ali, the new Sharif. Once Hussein was in power though, he began to grow suspicious of the new government in Turkey and their promotion of Turkic identity especially when construction on the Hajjaz railway began in 1908. Many Arabs feared that this would bring Turkish troops and their oppression into the region and thus wanted to stop it. But here in Arabia still, there was no real talk yet of pan-Arabist ideals. Further south in Asiya, anti-Turkish sentiment continued to grow and Said Muhammad ibn Ali al-Adrisi rose in power. He was the grandson of an Islamic scholar named Ahmad ibn Idris al-Farsi who again wanted to revive the religion. Well, in 1908, Said was made the new Imam of Asiya and his tribal allies began to take over towns from the Ottomans could never fully restore their power to the region, especially as the Italians in their war with the Turks would bombard Turkish bases here. This new religious group in power in Asiya would promote strict Sharia law and during the First World War, they largely sided with the British. The Ottomans were also losing their grip on Yemen as well. Here the Shia Zaidi people had long struggled against Ottoman occupation, but in the early 1900s, these fights intensified. Like in 1904, they rose up in Sana once again and forced the Ottomans to negotiate. When talks were delayed, there was another rebellion in 1911. This coincided with the Italo-Turkish war again though, which I'll get onto in a little bit. The Ottomans therefore feared that the Italians in East Africa could exploit the situation. So the Treaty of Dan was signed, granting Zaidi control over northern Yemen. 
Yahya Mohammed Hamid al-Din was made the new imam of this autonomous but essentially independent state. And Yahya would continue to rule in Yemen until long after World War I. The Arabs were also rebelling in the Levant. Back in 1900, the Shubak revolts broke out against heavy taxation. This was nothing out of the ordinary. But at this time in the early 20th century, the Ottomans were still using crusader castles like Montreal as barracks. The rebels were able to scale the walls of this castle, but they were quickly subdued. The Turks then punished the population by making women do forced labor. The men were obviously enraged, so they assaulted the castle again and forced the Ottomans out. The Turks quickly crushed the rebellion, but another wedge was driven between the Arabs and the Turks. There would be other rebellions nearby as well, like the Alatrash family, yet again, led Druze against the Ottomans. This rebellion, like many others, began due to a tribal conflict in 1909. The young Turks sent an army into the region, but this was a huge army of 21,000 men. This army far exceeded anything the Druze could field, so the Turks easily won the battles and killed many of the inhabitants of the region. The Druze were then forced to disarm and many were forced into the Ottoman army, being sent to the furthest reaches of the empire. But there was now also an almost irreparable break in relations between the Druze and the Turks. So when the Arabs would revolt in World War I, the Alatrash family would join the rebels. The young Turks though wanted to push on and bring conscription, disarmament and the likes across the Levant. But when they arrived at El Karak, the people rose up under the leadership of one of the dominant clans in the town known as the Majali family. They joined with many angry Bedouin tribes and captured key stations along the Hejaz railway and destroyed many government buildings. Once again, it was crushed, their leaders were killed, hundreds were sentenced to forced labor, and once again, relations worsened. The Ottomans would also lose key lands in Arabia to foreign powers. In 1903, Ibn Saud began to launch campaigns against Jabal Shamar. Although this conflict was mainly made up of a few sporadic battles, it allowed the Saudis to take Al Qasim in 1907. A few years of peace then followed before the Saudis expanded again. This time they pushed on Al Hassa, which the Ottomans had controlled since the 1870s. There the Shia inhabitants negotiated surrender in return for religious freedoms. And this conquest cut off the Ottomans from their garrisons in Qatar, so it was negotiated that they too should be withdrawn. But this land that the Saudis just took was largely occupied by the Ajman tribe and they would challenge the Saudis for control during World War I. The Ottomans did also have some small clashes with the British in this region. Like in 1906, Ottoman troops moved into Aqaba, hoping to secure access to the Red Sea. The British and Ottomans reached a peaceful agreement, with the British handing over land west of the city. But many in Egypt were outraged by this, because the British were now making deals on their behalf. Mustafa Kamil Pasha in particular was one of the most vocal critics of the British at this time. He in fact had long been opposed to the British occupation of his country, and back in 1895, even requested that the French help to expel them. For instance, he said to the French, the English committed an injustice after an injustice, but they have convinced Europe that we are a fanatic people. We are not fanatics, are hostile to Christians. He, like many in the Egyptian elite, were still Francophiles and still often spoke French to each other. And he also promoted French Republican ideals in his newspaper, the Al Liwa. But he also rejected the idea of Arab or Islamic unity and began to look more towards an Egyptian identity and celebrated their ancient history. As such, he, like many others, also turned to Japan for inspiration. This was also in part because the French and the British had just signed the Entente Cordiale and Egypt was recognized as part of Britain's sphere. But he also believed that Japanese imperialism was justified, and so too was Egypt's. Like he said Sudan was rightfully theirs because of the right of conquest, and he often saw the Sudanese as inferior people. Tensions though grew worse within British Egypt, thanks to the Densawai incident. By this point, British people had been filling up the ranks of the government and working alongside the Khedive, who many people now saw as even more corrupt. Then in 1906, British officers were hunting pigeons and were attacked by a group of locals who depended on the animals for food. A British officer then shot a woman in the fight and a series of unfortunate events then followed, escalating the situation. As one soldier ran home, he died of a heat stroke. An Egyptian tried to help him, but other officers found him near the body and assumed he was a murderer. So he was killed as well. And then an Egyptian who saw what happened stabbed one of the officers. 
the British army arrested over 50 men and brought them to trial. Both British and Egyptian judges then sentenced some of them to death, some to hard labour and others to be flogged. This was supposed to quell further nationalist rebellions, but really it had the opposite effect. But the Algerians under French rule were having a far worse time. French forces had continued on their pacification campaign south, bringing their control down to the southern borders, and largely ending the military campaign in 1903. But many of the leadership were often pretty brutal and open about it. Also, after their loss against Germany in 1870, the French had grander ambitions for Algeria. In the words of Adolphe Cremieux, to destroy the military regime and to completely assimilate Algeria into France. Speculators bought up some of the most arable land and hundreds of thousands of people migrated, forming a community known as the Pied Noir. This was the basis of a settler colony which could turn Algeria into a French province. But while European settlers were given citizenship, the locals were in a bit of a strange grey area. Like in 1908, the French wanted to introduce conscription to defend against a growing German army. However, the Piet Noir were worried about arming the Algerians, and conscription would possibly lead to the locals also demanding citizenship. And they were sort of right, as a new group of local intellectuals known as the Young Algerians did permission the government to expand suffrage. But this was just a small group, and the following year conscription was introduced with no real extension of rights. Only a couple thousand people were ever conscripted a year though, while the rest of the Algerians in the French army voluntarily joined the Spahis. While over the border, French expansion in Morocco nearly brought about a world war a decade earlier. The French had long had their eyes on the country, but for the most part, the British had defended the Moroccan Sultan. Nevertheless, the French continued to move into Moroccan lands and even claimed Tuat. The Moroccans had ruled over this land through a series of alliances with local tribesmen, and these tribes now united to form a confederation under the command of a man named Ba Sidi. He hoped to resist against the French, but they were defeated at the Battle of Tagut, and the French connected Algeria to their colonies in West Africa. The rebels continued to attack French patrols, but in 1903, they were defeated at the Battle of El Mungar. Shortly after this, the French and the British signed the Entente Cordiale, and this, as I said before, secured British control over Egypt. And importantly here, it also allowed the French to finally expand into Morocco. The French followed much of the same pattern as they had before. As Morocco had taken out huge loans which they could not pay back, the French created a debt administration to oversee repayment. Sultan Abdelaziz though had long struggled to collect taxes and he continued to face rebellions. Like in 1902, Bohumara rose up. He had served as a secretary in the royal court but was exiled. He then came back on a donkey and tried to claim the throne for himself. He gained the support of many tribes around Rif and moved into Taza. There he drove back the Sultan's forces and killed many Jews by pouring petrol on them and setting them alight. And he continued to hold power in the town for a few more years. But then, in 1905, the German Kaiser arrived in Morocco and promised to support the Sultan. Abdulaziz then followed the Kaiser's advice and called for an international congress to discuss the reforms needed. This went completely against the French plans. Plus, to make matters even worse, the Kaiser threatened to defend Morocco's independence through war. This he hoped would drive a wedge between the Entente, yet it actually brought the British and French closer together, and the French also threatened war. To end this, the first Moroccan crisis, the powers met to sign the Treaty of al -Jakiras. The police, army, regulations and generally the country would need to be reformed, and the new national bank with their new banknotes would begin repaying their huge debt. Spanish and French officers would also be brought in to oversee much of the army and police force. However, the delegates that the Sultan sent could barely speak a foreign language and just sat there saying nothing. Plus, the town didn't have a telegraph or telephone line, so the different delegates couldn't speak to their own leaders. And crucially, in practice, none of this could really be implemented, as the Sultan, again, had very little control outside of his capital. And it was all undone straight away anyway, as the French pharmacist, known as Emile Mochamp, was assassinated and the French press called for war. Ojda and Casablanca were quickly occupied in 1907 and the Moroccans, realizing the Sultan was too weak to do anything about it, turned to his brother, Abd al-Hafid. 
the Islamic leaders declared that he was the real sultan and a jihad was declared to reclaim lost lands. Their forces met Abdelaziz outside of Marrakesh and forced him to flee to French-occupied Casablanca. Abd al-Hafid was now the new sultan, but he began to target many of his old allies and create new enemies. For instance, Muhammad al qahtani was a Sufi leader that had supported him, but he began to disagree with the sultan making more deals with the Europeans. So the sultan had him shaved, paraded through the streets, had his hands cut off, salt was poured in the wounds, and then killed in front of all of his family. Then he went to Fez to demand that money be handed over. There, Lala Batul, the wife of the governor, was chained to a wall in a crucifix position, her breasts were put in a vice, and she was flogged. Meanwhile, in the north, the fake royal Buhumara still controlled lands. To make a little money, he sold mining concessions to the Spanish, but this brought him into a conflict with Spain's old rivals, the Rif tribes. Under Mohammed Amazian, they attacked the Spanish mines, and working with the Moroccan army, they defeated Bohumara. Most of his army were either beheaded or mutilated in public. As for Bohumara, he was put into a small cage, and then, according to some stories, thrown into a pit of lions. The new sultan was therefore a pretty despotic ruler. However, the chaos in the north allowed the Spanish to launch another campaign in Melilla, after many of their miners and railroad workers were killed by rift tribes. The Spanish, though, had signed the Pact of Cartagena with the British and French, promising to maintain the status quo in the Mediterranean. But in reality, this also gave the Spanish room to expand in the north. They were a pretty poor nation, though, unable to hold on to much of their empire. And a great deal of their army was made up of either conscripts or impressed men. So when the campaign began, the people of Spain rose up, forcing the government to declare a state of war to put down the rebels, during this, the tragic week. While over in Morocco, their army was suffering. Riffian guerrillas decimated their advances, forcing Spain to bring in reinforcements. With their help in 1910, they took over Cape Tres Forcas through numbers alone. The following year, the Sultan faced tribal rebellions around Fez. They had suffered under his despotism, believed he was surrendering to European influence again, and hated many of his reforms, particularly in the restructuring of the national army. The Sultan called on the French to save him as he was besieged in his palace. The Germans also sent a gunboat to Agadir to monitor the situation, but this started the Agadir crisis. In theory, the Germans were protecting the Sultan, but behind the scenes, the French and the Germans were negotiating a treaty. In this treaty, the Germans would receive land in Central Africa and allow the French to take over Morocco. The Spanish then once again expanded in the north. As the leader of the Rift tribes called for a jihad, another campaign was launched, and once again the Spanish won. The French and the Spanish then met to partition the country in 1912, while the Moroccan Sultan was forced to sign the Treaty of Fez. He abdicated in favour of his brother Yusuf, who was now under French control. Many regional powers were kept in place, while the French took control of the army, important government departments, and of course, they bought up huge chunks of land as well. But many of the tribes just decided to appoint their own sultan, Ahmed al hiba or the Blue Sultan. His family were the leaders of the Qadariya Sufi Brotherhood, and had long fought against European incursions. So, in Tiznit, he was made the new sultan, and a general rebellion broke out. He received the support of Tami el glawi who had climbed through the ranks, and had been gifted control over towns like Marrakesh. He opened his gates to the rebels, but the French quickly descended on them and scattered the Blue Sultan's armies. Tami el glawi would then swap sides and join the French, while the Blue Sultan would continue to claim the throne from his base in the Atlas Mountains. The French, though, would continue to make more enemies as they tried to take control of the lands between Taza and Canifera. Here, leaders of powerful confederations united, like Moha o Hamu of the Zayan Confederation. They once again declared a holy war against the French, and attacks on pro-French tribes began. The French could not subdue this new rebellion, and further campaigns into the region were stopped, as troops were quickly redeployed to Europe at the beginning of World War I. But back in Europe, though, the Italians had been denied Tunisia, and now they were being kept out of colonial efforts in the Mediterranean. So they focused on acquiring Libya, and began incentivizing investments and in migration to the region while their press called for an invasion. Italy at this time was part of the Triple Alliance with Germany and Austria, but they still decided to get approval from Britain and France for an invasion. The Ottomans were already growing wary of such an action, 
so began sending ships with ammunition to Libya. But this action was just used as a cause for war, as the Italians stated the Turks were supporting extremists. The CUP then received an ultimatum, but this was rejected, so tens of thousands of Italian troops secured the coastal cities. The Ottoman navy at this point was no match for the Italians at sea, and the British prevented them from moving on land through Egypt. So Enver Pasha, Mustafa Kemal and others snuck into Libya and began to organise a resistance, turning the conflict into a stalemate. The Italians dug trenches and used some of the latest military technology, like armoured cars and planes. In fact, the first ever aerial assault was carried out during this war by Giulio Gavotti. To break the stalemate, the Italians changed tactics. In early 1912, they blockaded ports in Yemen, reducing Ottoman influence in that region, and defeated their navy near Lebanon. Then, in the summer, the Italians moved troops in to occupy Rhodes and Kos. Over in Istanbul, the loss of Libya, along with rebellions in Albania, further weakened the prestige of the CUP. After all, they had taken power to defend the nation, but now they were losing land. So, in July 1912, a group of officers who called themselves the Saviour Officers launched a coup. These were really just supporters of the Freedom Party, and this party promoted decentralisation and giving more rights to minorities. So, they had support from Albanians and others. Plus, they were more liberal and wanted to copy the British system, all of which the CUP opposed. But this coup largely began because of the election of 1912. During the campaign, both sides came up with bold accusations and often resorted to violence. In fact, it was actually called the election of the clubs because many of the CUP beat opposition candidates with clubs and sticks. In the end though, the CUP just rigged the election and won 269 out of 275 seats. So the saviour officers got support from the Minister of War, Mahmoud Shevek Pasha, and after some unrest, the Grand Vizier resigned. As you can probably see at this point though, nobody truly held much power. The Sultan wielded some, the Grand Vizier had a lot, but they often ruled for less than a year, many of them just for a couple of weeks or months, and whoever held Parliament had power as well, but they often had disagreements within their own parties. So a new non-partisan cabinet was created by Ahmed Mutar Pasha. But new elections were delayed, because after Italy's victories, the Balkan states formed an alliance known as the Balkan League. The Ottomans, eager to make peace, quickly agreed to cede Libya and the Dodecanese islands to the Italians. The Italians though still only really controlled the cities in the north. The countryside was the domain of the Senussi order under the leadership of Ahmed Sharif. If this Senussi order had declared their independence, they would actually have had a huge empire at this point. They already had connections with Somali dervish rebel leaders like Nur Ahmed Aman, and they joined Dud Mari of the Wadai Empire in their fight against the French. The Turks though now had to deal with the First Balkan War. Serbia, Montenegro, Greece and Bulgaria having signed an alliance, all declared war at the same time. Ahmed Mutar Pasha resigned after being caught completely off guard, and Kamil Pasha took over. He however had to deal with humiliating defeats. The Greeks captured Thessaloniki in late 1912, and the Bulgarians were moving incredibly close to Istanbul. The Ottomans were poised to hand over huge chunks of land once again, so the CUP wanted to come back to power. In January 1913, Enver Pasha marched on parliament, and in the ensuing firefights, some people were killed, including Nazem Pasha, the Minister of War. But this wasn't actually the plan, as they actually hoped to install Nazim as Grand Vizier. The coup leaders then proceeded into the room of Kamil Pasha and forced him to resign. Enver declared that the coup was unfortunate, but it was impossible to wait. A delay of a few hours and the country would have been shamefully delivered to the enemy. The Ottoman Empire was now largely being ruled by the three Pashas. Enver Pasha, Talat Pasha and Jamal Pasha. But they still didn't have complete power, just yet, as Mahmoud Shavak was made the Grand Vizier, as a sort of compromise. He refused to agree to the Treaty of London though, as the Bulgarians were poised to take over most of Thrace outside of Istanbul. But he was assassinated in June 1913 by a relative of Nazim Pasha who was out for revenge. The three Pashas were now in full control, and fortunately for them, the Balkan nations began to fall out with one another over their newly conquered lands. The Bulgarians in particular made many enemies and went to war against their neighbours. The three Pashas then scrambled to join in 
and reclaim land including Adrianople in this, the Second Balkan War. But in the wake of this war, the CUP became decidedly more nationalistic. Turks had lived in many of the lost territories for centuries, but many of these were massacred. It wasn't just the Turks though, as maybe as many as 120,000 Albanians were killed, and so too were many Muslim Bulgarians, who were known as the Pomaks. In many areas, Muslim villages were systematically torched, like in Monastir, where 80% of the houses were destroyed. All of this left tens of thousands dead, and nearly 300,000 refugees. Even after the wars, the British consuls reported that in the new Serbian lands, women were assaulted, people were massacred, and villages continued to be torched. The Carnegie Commission tried to investigate further, but they found the Serbian government unwilling to aid them or stop the killings. However, it should be said that massacres were commonplace across the region, like Greeks would kill Bulgarians and vice versa. The CUP though responded by deporting Greeks from Turkey. A paramilitary was then created called the Special Organization to drive them from their homes. And this organization also gave the government plausible deniability. The special organization was made up of a mix of people, including released convicts and Circassian emigres. They began to attack Greek towns and businesses, even massacring some like at Phocia. In many regards, this was in revenge for the destruction of Muslim villages in lost Balkan lands, but it would also help provide lands and homes for the refugees arriving in Turkey. It's estimated that 200,000 Greeks left Turkey for Greece during this period, and it could have inspired future events like the deportation and genocide of Armenians in the east. Eventually though, Venizelos of Greece made a deal with the Turks. If they were to stop the deportations, Greece would remain neutral in future wars. So by November 1914, when the First World War had already broke out, the Turks agreed and the deportations ended. Yet problems still existed elsewhere. Like in Bitlis in March 1914, the Kurds rebelled once again. They were fighting against forced conscription and the end of the Hamadiyya regiments. These were irregular Kurdish forces that had long repressed many of their neighbours, but they were now seen as outdated in the Young Turk's new army. So the Kurds allegedly received some Russian support and took over the city for a month or so before being crushed. And 1914 also marked the beginning of Seifo, a targeted campaign against the Assyrian Christians or part of the larger Assyrian genocide. These Assyrians largely lived in rural villages up in the mountains, especially in the Hakari Mountains, today in southeastern Turkey. There they lived alongside the Kurds, but relations were strained and many massacres took place in the 19th century. Then, after the Young Turk Revolution, the Kurdish emir of Bawari expelled thousands of them from his lands. So Shimon the 19th Benjamin, the patriarch of the Assyrian church, began to send letters to the Russians requesting aid. In return for any assistance, he promised to support the Russians in a future conflict. Then, when many Assyrians refused to join the Ottoman army, the massacres began. In August 1914, Talat Pasha ordered the deportation and resettlement of many Assyrians living on the Persian border. Many of these were killed during the process and would continue to be killed throughout the war. As for the Armenians, in July 1914, they held a congress in Erzurum, and even invited the CUP to attend. There they were asked to incite rebellions among Armenians in the Russian Empire. In return, they would receive their own autonomous provinces, which were drawn out that year as part of the 1914 Armenian reforms. These autonomous provinces would be overseen by the great powers and then allegedly grant them some degree of safety. As for the Ottomans, it would ensure their safety on their eastern borders. Yet the Armenians refused and the ruling Young Turks began to grow paranoid about their allegiances. So the killings would only grow worse during the war when the Ottomans finally joined the Central Powers. 